The Pitch and Prime podcast is presented by Brew HQ, your home brewing headquarters. Whether you're an advanced brewer or just starting your brewing journey, Brew HQ has everything you need. Enjoy fast, free shipping in Canada on orders over $75. Get 10% off your first order by going to brewhq.ca and use coupon code BREWPOD10. That's B-R-E-W-P-O-D and the number 10 at checkout. Brew HQ. Life is brutiful. Thanks for joining us on our quest to educate in all homebrewing subjects. I'm your host, Jonathan Primack, and I'm here with the Brew HQ crew, Brew HQ manager, Julie Guy, and brew guru, Tyler Graves, both of whom you will hear from time to time. November 4th is Learn to Homebrew Day, so for our inaugural podcast, we've decided to journey back to the humble beginnings of some professional and amateur homebrewers. We'll learn about turning your homebrewing hobby into a career, being a female in a male-dominated industry, and some of the signs behind homebrewing. Our first guest is Kelly Costello, assistant brewer at Good Robot Brewing in Halifax, Nova Scotia. We sat down with her to discuss her unconventional journey into brewing. Can you tell us a bit about how, how you got your start in brewing? Were you a home brewer first or was it uh, Not technically. Head, head I guess my, it was head first. Everything yeah. I do is head first. <laughs> <laughs> so the first beer I ever made was actually at Good Robot on the Sabco. I was learning about beer because it had gotten pretty quiet and I usually worked the retail area. So I wasn't exactly dealing with customers too much. And so I was just reading about beer and there were so many things that I just didn't understand. And I figured the best way to learn would be by doing and so I hassled Doug and hassled Doug and the poor guy finally gave in and showed me how to use the Sabco mostly it was a crazy day for him um and then I went home and bought a kit and then bought another kit and then bought another kit and I was like Fuck this I can do this for real and then did it with all grain and then hassled the boys some more and they let me use the Sabco again and so it was a pretty I would say short-lived home brewing career it was right. intense I made a lot yeah. of beer at home. You had to make up a lot of ground in <laughs> yeah. a small period of time. Yeah, exactly. Because it became a job pretty much right off the Pretty bat. much right away, yeah. yeah. It okay. was great. <laughs> Which is uh, probably an interesting uh, learning curve uh, compared yeah. to most home brewers who really get to take their time and, and work on little things and usually use kits. Um, but you, you were probably right into the thick of it, um, you know, and having to learn about you know, water conditioning and, oh, yeah. and, and various things that are a little more advanced mm-hmm. um, by by um, most people's standards. I think it's pretty safe to say that for the first, like, four to six months of beta brewing, remember, I do one a week, I was learning alongside the beta brewers half the time. Right. So it'd be like, I don't know, I threw this in here to see what would happen. And they'd be like, okay, you're the boss. <laughs> and so the beta brewers are people from within the community. Just out, whoever, Whoever yeah. wants to sign up within yeah. the community can come down. And Initially it was, I did gear it at brewers. So I had, I got to make one with Alicia uh, from Port Rexton. That was highlight, personal highlight. And then I just would bring in home brewers to be like, okay, how do you do this? What do you do? What does this mean to you? Yeah, we can play with a super fancy setup, the brew magic. Right. Which is so fickle. <laughs> like, I love it and I hate it so often. <laughs> but yeah, and now it's kind of a mix between people who brew and people who've never brewed before. So, Right. Yeah. And the, the Sabco brew magic, for people who don't know, is... I guess, an advanced um, kind of all-in-one system with kind of digital control. Which Um, I still haven't figured out. Right? (laughs) (laughs) Yes, yeah, I've seen it myself and it did. You've brewed on it. That's right, yeah, (laughs) Yeah. well, that's right. um, uh, Yeah, so it's it's an interesting setup. Definitely not uh, not an entry level. No, (laughs) I think it's prohibitively expensive in that regard, too. (laughs) Uh, So do you remember... What your first brew was? Right. I grabbed the Saison kit because it was the, like, I figured it would hide flaws. Right. (laughs) You know, because Saisons are typically pretty weird. So I was like, I'll try this. And so that was the first time I, like, you know, the maiden voyage on my own. Right. Yeah. And how did it turn out? Delicious. I drank it all. Perfect. Called it Tis the Saison. (laughs) Clever, eh? It came out around Christmas. That's excellent. Yeah. (laughs) 
Excellent. So, um, I mean, perfect. Not perfect. Perfect. The first bottle I opened, I didn't chill it. Oh. <laughs> so it blew up in my face and got all over the kitchen. Of course, this is when I popped home. I hadn't even taken my coat off. I was just like running home to get something. And I was like, I should try one of my beers. And then it blows up all over the kitchen. I had to like call and say it would be late and clean up the kitchen. <laughs> right. But yeah, it worked out after that. So, so that, there's a bit of a, cause my next, that leads into the next question is, was, you know, what was the learning curve? What have you, what have you learned from day one? Uh, you know, the not to do's. And so mm. as, as home brewers, we do learn early on that, uh, you know, yeah. your naturally carbonated beer certainly needs to be chilled before you 100%. try to open it up. <laughs> yeah. Is there any, anything else, um, you know, throughout the experience that uh, that you've kind of picked up, you know, maybe misconceptions you had about brewing that you now know better? Um, yeah, for sure. I mean, there's almost so many that it would be hard to, like, like I said, I started brewing to learn about beer, and it turns out every time you think you've got it figured out, there's a thousand more things to figure out. Um, I guess I'm not afraid of lagers anymore. I used to be like, I can't make a lager. I don't have the setup. Turns out the brewery's perfectly cold enough. Right. It's actually harder to make ales. Um, Not as scared of water chemistry anymore. Right. Because once you figure out why things do what, I can take that away from her if you want me to. Okay. You want to tell us who's making a camera? Zelda, you, uh, you a home? Are you a little brew pup? We do, yeah. We do have a brew pup. <laughs> Every, everyone has a brew pup. Everyone with a pup and beer has a brew pup. Um, I've been pretty lucky in terms of beer turning out. I've only had one fail, and I consider it epic. <laughs> it was a milk, sh- a milk stout, chocolate milk stout. And I made it with other brewers, like other home brewers. So I was really kind of saddened when it didn't turn out, but it got sour. Uh, and when something gets sour with lactose, it's disgusting. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, like alternatively, you can get milk, like Coca Cola or like yeah, sour milk. It was bad. We I didn't end up serving that one. Right. <laughs> yeah. Oh, and then there's I don't know if you can see the fermenter over there. There's a carboy with a brown ale in it that is a really interesting pellicle, and I'm just I haven't touched it. It's like a, it's a year old now, and it's either going to be <laughs> glorious or not so. Or not it's so glorious, yeah, it's so. either like an Uda Bruin or just trash. Yeah. <laughs> I don't, yeah, I'm, I'm scared to open it. And I, I did notice we're actually uh, Kelly's hosting us at her uh, private residence, and I did notice there are uh, some fermenters lined up in the hallway. So, um, so it's not just work for you. Well, that's wine. There's the beer, yeah, that sad beer that I haven't dealt with. I don't really brew at home anymore. In fact, okay. my equipment. My equipment, my canning pot that I use, I have lent it out to someone who's figuring out home brewing. So I don't even have the stuff here to make beer anymore. All right, okay. But that is wine because uh, you can't always drink beer. <laughs> <laughs> so you need to diversify. Exactly. <laughs> but what does um, is is brewing entwined itself in in your life more than just um, as a work? You know, does is 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 beer important to you? Have you you learned something about yourself through your brewing? Yeah, I mean, I never really saw myself doing such a physical job. Mm-hmm. You know, before this, I was a teacher, right? And I guess I still am in a way. It's become a tool for teaching. Mm-hmm. I love beer, honestly. It's become something that I kind of live and breathe, which sounds friggin' intense now that I think about it. But <laughs> you know, it's just become something that is part of everything. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, it's a tool for teaching. It's honestly a tool for making social change, if only through the beta brew program. But um, yeah, yeah, it's definitely more than just a job and more than just a hobby. Yeah. You mentioned um, social change, which is interesting because, as we know, there's not as many female brewers, mm. um, you know, home brewers or in in the industry. Um, what does it mean to you, if anything, to be a, a female brewer in 2018? Well, it means a lot. It means, I mean, and I was, I've always been a pretty outspoken woman and an advocate for us because I think that it's just time to stop putting pressure on anyone to be a certain thing. It's, it's just, it's old. Stop it, <laughs> you know? And it's, I find as a brewer, it's, there's like this ancient 
all these ancestors to lean on, like women for yonks were the one making the beer. I mean, we all know this now. Right. Yes. So for me, it's just like returning to something that would have been done anyway. Of like, I, you know, making beer for your family is a big, important part of taking care of your family. Right. And no, like, I, yeah. At one point in history, we know that uh, men weren't even allowed to brew. You know, no, not at all. It wasn't just that women primarily brewed. It was that they were the only ones legally illegally allowed to brew and for a long time beer was a woman's drink Mm -hmm. because it was you know not as strong as wine right i'll take it (laughs) i'll take it so yeah i mean i've i guess in being a a woman brewer in 2018 i'm keeping my my good robot family (laughs) safe (laughs) boiling the water if you will (laughs) and do you feel there's uh do you feel there's a change on the horizon do you do you notice uh, more and more women entering into either the hobby or the the um, industry the workforce absolutely i mean like the more you see yourself in it the more you're likely to do it so having very visible people like me or emily tipton or uh or events like fembot and the fembot homebrew competition and i think spindrift even made a point of inviting women to enter their competition as well like that's that's these are all really important steps and the more you see yourself and see it as an option then it's just yeah, it's the playing field will even out because it's not you don't do you don't use your genitals to make beer, so it shouldn't really factor, right? And I also understand at one point you you had an all female um, competition yes. uh, at we'll Kid Robot, this year. and you'll be doing it again this year. Uh, can you tell us what the turn it was like and what the response um, was like? I was so shocked. We had like 10 people sign up for the first four weeks it was advertised. And I was like, oh, this isn't going to be worth it. No one's going to do this. And then all of a sudden we had 35 people signed up. 35 people, 35 women or, you know, female presenting individuals or identifying individuals. And it was, the turnout was brilliant. The beer, I still have some of the beers in my fridge. Wow. <laughs> yeah, like some of the stouts and stuff. So, yeah, and it, yeah, it was super fun. And I got to make the beer with the, or a beer on the Beta Brew sister, the Sabco, with the winner. And then, and a really, like, solid community effort. Like, anybody on the Facebook page for the event, if someone needed a capper, they would put it out there. And it would be like, I am done with my capper. You can borrow my capper. Or, like, right. do you need a strainer or a car another carboy or whatever like it was a really good very very communal yeah in spite very, of the fact very... that there could only really be one winner it felt like everyone was working together on this one right and i'm pretty sure i got like every female brewer in the province <laughs> and and should should we look at it as as you being a female brewer or should we look at it as you being a brewer that happens to be female you know is there is there a right it depends way? on what you're looking at me for you know <laughs> like do you need beer or do you need someone to represent someone who doesn't have representation so it at the end of the day i am both so whatever right. <laughs> yeah. it's not a great answer but i don't really know how to answer that <laughs> um we spoke earlier about uh the beta brews and 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 this being a, a podcast about uh Home brewers, and it sounds like you're in a unique position, um, whereas you have these brewers come in weekly, um, and they're and these days they're mostly home brewers, amateur brewers. They ha- they haven't made beer before, yeah. So you you kind of have an interesting um, insight in, into the home brewer's mind. Do you see a theme, a certain inspiration to try it out? Um, what's what's driving people towards towards trying this? Towards trying beta brew? Yeah. Um, I think there's a certain license to experimentation when you're working alongside someone who can say, this might not work, why don't we try it this way? Like, for example, if you want to, I don't know, put cranberries in your beer, like, maybe we won't put it in during the boil, maybe we'll put it in post-fermentation. Like, someone who can guide you along in your experimentation sort of streamlines your experimentation. And I have found... There's definitely a difference in people who have never brewed before versus people who've brewed a couple of times versus people who brew often. Like people who have never brewed before, they want to make something crazy. They want to, they, you know, they want to bring a flavor and add beer. Right. So it'll be like a. They're the fringe brewers. Exactly, yeah. and that's what cra- makes craft beer great, right? Yeah. <laughs> and then people who've been home brewing for a while, they bring in and they want to perfect a recipe. So they usually come with a recipe and they're like, "Well, I didn't find this to be great. How can we fix that?" And we'll work together on that. I have had more than one woman come in just because she's like, I 
see that you're a woman. Can we do this together? Right. Like, so yeah. it's mm-hmm. a bit of a safe space for some. Certainly. And, Absolutely. Uh, for others, you know, who may not have brewing equipment or whatever they get. Yeah, that's a, a big part of it. Hands. Or just perfecting a recipe in a brewery. Or I had one guy come in just because he's retired and he didn't have anything to do. <laughs> I was like, sweet, Randy, let's make your red beer. <laughs> you yeah, know? Why, why not? It was great. <laughs> Perfect. Excellent. Kelly, well, thank you so much for having us. Uh, we enjoyed talking to you and learning a little bit about what you do. And uh, hopefully we get a chance to talk to you again. Yeah. Thanks for coming. All right. We're here with uh, Ian Wheatley, uh, local home brewer here in uh, Halifax, Nova Scotia. We've uh, brought him into the Brew HQ headquarters. How are you doing, Ian? Fantastic. Thank you for having me. Awesome. Uh, so, Ian, uh, we're, we're doing a, a chat today about um, home brewing and people's experience in home brewing and how, how they got to where they are. Um, I understand in real life you're a, a registered resp- respiratory therapist, rather. So, uh, so you, you have a little bit of a science background and you've done some chemistry as well in your life. So, uh, that must play a part in in uh in your home brewing life does it for sure for sure uh my background degree was a bachelor of health science uh and i did in a lot of that biology chemistry some useless courses like statistics but uh <laughs> so, more so the biochemistry as well but also with uh home brewing like with my kegerator setup and stuff i used a lot of pressurized gases as well so all those gas laws came into play and yeah the start of the show oh, yeast wow. and learned a lot about that so yeah awesome and uh, so when did you take up home brewing? That was <clears throat> 2008, I believe. Uh, so in 2007, moved up to the city to study my degree at Dell. And then I think it was only 17. So 2008, legally, I turned 19 at the end of 2008. But uh, I, I realized I really liked beer, my roommate and I, and we had no money. So it was not until... Working a job actually at Statistics Canada, so I guess the stats course did come into play. But uh, I met a buddy, Nick Snell, um, tall, scrawny, Picto County guy, <laughs> and he introduced me to this guy. I think his name was Jeff. Uh, really nice, easygoing guy, but he was into fermenting all kinds of weird things. So he was telling me on breaks about fermenting stuff in a plastic bucket that would give you some sort of safe alcohol drink and then you go on about like fermenting you know veggies and stuff like that and oh just skim the top mold layer off and stuff so and being in a health science degree I didn't believe any of it but I did like beer and I had no money so started brewing that way yeah right so it was a matter of survival is, is basically yeah. how brewing came around. And, and Nick and I, I had a cheap apartment, but it was quite big. Um, the quality was low, but I had extra space for these plastic buckets. And we made beer. That was about all I could say about yeah. it. But yeah, nobody died. But yeah. <laughs> What did you start with? Uh, you probably weren't focused too much on stylistic accuracy or anything yeah. at the time. I All I knew was... You know, what Nick had given me and stuff for beer and, I mean, you know, dabbled in like Keith's or something and before that had like non-alcoholic beer with like pasta or something when I was younger. So I had no palate for it. I just, well, I kind of did, but I knew I wanted to get into it, but it was like probably one of the muntins, like just a canned kit or something. And then it was, at the end it was beer, constant battle with fruit flies and mice and all that, but it was not it went better than now what i thought it should have been like it wasn't acetic it wasn't you know vinegar or anything but yeah all right let's uh maybe jump forward a little bit so let's let's talk about a point where you've settled in uh to brewing as a hobbyist and you, you've gotten into all grain brewing um what kind of styles really drew your attention uh, I got into the hoppier styles because you just couldn't find them. You could find maltier, you could find watered down beers, but you just couldn't find something with like fresh, right. fresh hop so flavors. Before that wave of hop forward beers came along, when people were starting to crave that flavor. Yeah, and I mean my IPAs still weren't IPAs. My pale ales, like you know, they weren't the new kind of hop bursted ones or anything. They were still because. You just couldn't get a lot of it, and hops were expensive. It was more bitter at the front, like kind of more, I would say, British kind of IPA styles. But And then that's what moved me into best case styles and kind of doing partial mash was, I think, the 
uh, 1820 British IPA type style. And right, was, right. So one of those, the best case kits that comes with the malt and hops and grains. And yeah, you yeah. boil it up on the stove, right? Yeah. And so I got into that probably five or six years ago, and that was kind of getting a little bit more control, kind of getting flavors that you wanted, and yeah. Okay. And then at some point, of course, you would have started playing around and kind of adding your own, your own twist to it. Um, so having been involved in brewing uh, so long, what, what actually keeps you motivated and what helps you keep the creative edge? Uh, for motivated, when your keg starts to get empty, that's <laughs> pretty easy push. Uh, also, I find as well, like and the creative aspect is more just chatting to other brewers and almost like challenging each other to kind of do similar styles, like head to head almost, or just chatting to see what other people are doing. Because at times you can kind of get into a rut. I always do just five gallon batches. I've never done, or you know, up to six, but I never do double or triple batches. Everything that I make is different. So you do kind of run out of ideas until you start chatting with other people and trying their stuff. And then you kind of learn how to tweak little things and do unconventional stuff. And Right, yeah. right. So kind of, yeah, it's a natural progression. You know, what's, yeah. what's the next coolest thing to come out? And hopefully at some point in time, you're, you're the one to, to start the... Uh, start the new wave or new trend yeah um although i can get pretty basic sometimes like if a new england ipa came out like i would try to make one of those and yeah right so um going back i guess a little bit um to your schooling i mean more for you than some i guess your your professional life which really has nothing to do with brewing um but there might be some things that cross over can you you know, many brewers are more artisanal in, in approach, especially new brewers that are self-taught kind of from information they find online. So can you tell me a bit about the contrast between an artisanal approach and a scientific approach? Yeah, so I definitely didn't come from the creative side of things. I Even now, still, I'm teaching my palate stuff. Like, I'll, you know, not pick up as well and diacetyl and things like that, and I'll have to train off of other people's stuff. Um, but I was very much scientific. I wanted, you know, clean, crisp beers. I, I knew more so the chemistry of it and how things would interact, but flavor-wise, I couldn't tell you. You know, I now know the compounds, but back then I was more so on yeast, what it needs, how to manipulate it, what temperatures, stuff like that, you know, stressing it in good ways and bad ways. But for coming up with recipes, I was kind of shooting in the dark, and that's where my buddy uh, Nick came into play because he was uh, a cook at a couple different places as well, like Split Crow and areas like that. So he came in at the complete other end. So then he would actually be able to, you know, grab some malt and chew on it and be like, oh, let's do this mixture. More so I was, we should use this yeast, this temperature, you know. Right. Kinda, yeah. More which is, which is different. You know, most people um, don't have the tools to, to jump in from that side and look yeah. at it critically and, and understand, like you said, how is uh, stressing the yeast in a certain way going to either benefit or maybe take away from, and, and what do you need to do to utilize that information? Yeah. Um, do you feel maybe you lose out on some of the magic of brewing, whereas you're, you're coming more from a scientific approach? Maybe. Now I kind of more so understand it, because uh, before, yeah, it was just more so an endpoint. I had goals, I had building blocks but now i can kind of play around and kind of get more immersed in the flavors and stuff and too i mean i have the time and money now to actually cook food and stuff as well so just more so benefiting my uh, benefiting my palate that way and stuff but yeah i probably did lose out on some of the initial things of like having more of i want these types of flavors and then trying to let the brewing catch up i was more into the equipment and almost like an engineering point of view black and white exactly approach yeah um and i you know i i know that you do um competition brewing and and you know brewing is quite a large part of your life um in terms of a hobby um is there a reason why you know these days so many people are going professional when they they reach a certain level and i think you know, certainly locally, your your brewing is quite reputable, and you're well known in the competition circuit at this point. Um, why haven't you gone professional? Uh, I get that question a lot, actually. Um, it does come down more to job security and stuff. So, what I do for my job 
with like kids and babies and stuff uh, doing intensive care. It's that was my first love. And then it gave me kind of, you know, I have paid benefits and stuff like I compensated. I'm very happy with that. Um, so that gave me the more so risk free ability to brew stuff and know like if I completely tank on one. It's not like, you know, a how many barrel batch that, okay, well, now where's my revenue coming from? You don't so, have to yeah. Tell your wife that uh, <laughs> you need to sell the house. <laughs> yeah. And that's kind of like my brother, too. Like, he is more artistic with drawing and computer design and stuff, so, or graphic design. So, he did kind of the same route. He's actually also a respiratory therapist. And then he kind of started the company on the side. But, right. yeah. And it's more so, I like doing little single risk free batches. And, yeah. Could you see a point in time where you could take it to the next level? I could, yeah. Uh, not now. My wife would kill me. We have a three-month-old now, so yeah, it would be a little different. But uh, yeah, no, for sure. Um, more so, I could see it like partnering up with somebody and kind of building that way. I don't think I would take the big plunge on my own, right. but yeah, I'd have to take out my pension and stuff and just <laughs> risk it, yeah. But. Is there... Um... A trend that you tend to stick to with your brewing styles is—is is there a, a style of beer that you focus on, or maybe a region, um, regional beer that you focus on, or, or do you like to do your own thing? Uh, I'll go through phases. Now I'm kind of getting—I uh, am getting kind of like a broader palette and stuff. I mean, I used to only do pale, hoppier beers. Even just a brown ale would have been weird for me to make, but. And then I started getting into, you know, like black IPAs and stuff. But now I'm really kind of appreciating the delicates uh, or the delicacies of um, how to get little subtle flavors. Like even a lager, I would just be like, oh, well, that's a, a Budweiser, right? But then going and trying like actual Czech Pilsners and stuff. And you realize it's actually really tough to make like a really good solid Czech Pilsner, right? You have to take a lot of steps. And I mean, even those now I have a little bit more free time and flexibility that I can spend eight hours doing a double decoction whereas you know five ten years ago that wouldn't have even i wouldn't have had the space even but and i never appreciated like belgian ales as well the little banana cloves like all the different compounds there too and then just having other people as the whole community exploded other people just had these to just hand you at a party now right so right. it was yeah kind of expanded from outside of north america and now i'm trying to make more delicate kind of yeah nuanced beers Excellent. And, uh, you know, that kind of actually segues me um, to kind of ask about your brewing setup. You speak, you know, you say you have more time and more space these days than you originally did. Yeah. Um, do you, you know, what's your setup? What are you brewing on? Is it very basic or have you added some bells and whistles? So started with the buckets, moved on to like partial mash on the stove. And then probably about four years ago, I uh, started like a brew in a bag type deal which that seemed to work, you know, um, it's kind of, it was difficult. Like I didn't have a garage at the time and stuff, but, uh, so kind of just doing it outside based on the weather. But then that kind of got me into, it was like a safe way to do all grain. You didn't have to worry about, you know, stuck sparges, all that stuff, all the extra equipment. And then from there I jumped to, so I made a lot of beer for people and got a lot of gift cards and stuff and then ended up being <laughs> like, okay, this is the one time I'm going to buy a grain father and no, do okay. that. So yeah, I did that jump, but and I wouldn't recommend that right away because I learned so much with all the screw ups that I did with all the other cheaper setups right. and you learn how to fix things on the fly. So, right. but then once I got to the grandfather, I already had all of that knowledge and then it was like, it's almost like a bread maker for right. beer. And then, the grandfather, you know, it's, yeah, it's a great crossover because it, yeah. I mean, it is easy enough for an amateur to use, yeah. um, but it does take a lot of the heartache out for you know advanced brewers yeah and it's kind of cool using like a recirculation system and like so you do learn a little bit more on that too and then you focus more on grain crush and different you know enzyme activity and stuff but right yeah is there advice you think based off your experience that you could give to beginner home brewers um make mistakes <laughs> start from scratch don't get too fancy i i find that with my friends and i too we always like started making things i'm like oh we can make anything and then you make these horrible supposed to be complex beers that are completely out of balance and then you're like 
go, you know, look at your recipes and you're like, why do I have nine malts in this, like, you know, simple, like, brown ale or something or this little lager? And then you go back to the basics and just some of them, some of the best beers I've made now have, like, one or two malts, maybe one or two hops. Right. Used to muddy up IPAs with, like, six different types. And I had no way of, like, knowing which ratio or combinations worked. What was doing what. Yeah. And one of the best ones was a Czech Pilsner. It's just one hop. One, I didn't even know I was doing a smash at the time, but right. yeah. yeah. Excellent. Um, what, one last thing I wanted to ask about is I know um, in recent history, you've won a few brewing competitions that you've entered. Uh, what's it like as a home brewer having your recipe scaled up and brewed on a large system? It was a bit nerve wracking. <laughs> um, and to the competitions, whenever I started, I was horrible at them. I think the first one was a garrison, maybe it was a robust porter or something was the first one. And I went, I had like an oatmeal one. I had all these weird, I did not understand how competitions worked. And then kind of got placed on my ass a couple of times with the feedbacks. And then it's like, okay. And then really learned and then failed a bit more, but each time got a little bit better. And then by the end, it was like, okay, I need to trust their palates. I need to drink the beer beside the score sheets. I don't get, you know, crazy and cocky and stuff. Right. And then once I started picking up with some good results and stuff, and then finally got to brew on, I think the first time competition-wise was a Gahan one. And that was uh, the waterfront one, like 600 liters or something. And thankfully, that was a competition brew, so I knew, okay, they liked it enough. You know, Kyle Jepson was there at the time. It was easy to – he was there to help me scale up and stuff. And learned a lot that way. Um, but also, it was really, he just like threw me right in the mash ton too, and like was cleaning out. And it's like, so at like 5 30 in the morning, we're gonna mash in. And now we're like drenched in sweat at like 10 and we're cleaning stuff out. It's kind of surreal. But it was more nerve wracking with doing professional launches with like Tide House and stuff um, without knowing that your recipe was good or even palatable. So you're doing even like a sour that you'd never done before and you're just hoping because. You can have a lot of people notice if right. it's not a good recipe. But you're, you're dry at this point from a certain amount of experience. Exactly, so yeah. you have, at this point, when you put together a recipe and brew for the first time, you have a running idea yeah. of what you're getting into. And that's, yeah, that's key. Like kind of trusting yourself and not, you know, being like, okay, you've brewed for 10 years. Like I think you can, like you said, piece something together. But yeah, other times I've even had like a close friend just overthink it and over research it and have a really good brewer just make not a really good beer. And it's like, you just got to go with it. Yeah. Look back at past recipes and past failures and yeah. And just trust, trust yourself. Exactly. Trust in the brewing. <laughs> Ian, thanks so much for coming in today. We really enjoyed having you. Awesome. Thank you. Love trying new beer recipes? Love getting things delivered right to your door? The Brew HQ Brew Box Recipe Kit subscription is exactly what you need. Just surf over to Brew HQ. Select your method of brewing, pick a batch size, and pay for the year. Every quarter, we'll package quality ingredients for an exclusive seasonal recipe and deliver it right to your door. No hidden fees, free shipping. The Brew HQ Brew Box Recipe Kit subscription, bringing the brew to you. All right, we're back with the Brew HQ crew and here with Steve Crane of Spindrift Brewing Company. He's the assistant brewer here. How are you doing, Steve? I'm having a good day today. Great. Uh, right in the middle of a double pilot brew day. But yeah, I can hear a lot of noise in the background, so you're in full production, are you? Oh, we're, we're flying right now. Things are busy. Things are busy. We got a couple new beer coming out, a couple new things we're playing around with, and then when we have some downtime, we're just formulating right how, on. how far we can go with, yeah. with brews. So we're uh, we're talking about home brewing today, and uh, we wanted to we wanted to know a little bit about you. I understand you were a home brewer. You didn't go to school for brewing. You you kind of have um, organic beginning, so to speak. Yeah, um, I actually went through school for uh, cultural analysis and poetry. <laughs> <All> right, yeah. <laughs> yeah, which has a bit of an application. It's kind of seen. I very much feel you so have to be expressive in your beer making. Expressive <laughs> in your beer making and excited and passionate about it. But I feel that uh, to understand where you can go, you first have to understand what's been done and where we are now. Right. And then you get a good sense about where you want to go and where you can go and what the options are out there. Um, I first started brewing, God, I think it was 2018 right now. I think it was about five years ago. 
Five, five years, years ago, I did. I got a Christmas gift from my now wife, uh, and it was a wine kit. It was it was a wine. I started off with wine, and that idea of, of fermentation uh, got my brain, and so I did a I did a wine, and then very quickly, within a few weeks, it was like new and beer. And, beer. and I had talked about it for a long time before I started brewing. I had my own. All homebrewers have their own little brew brand because it's fun to do. So I had that all set up. And she's like, well, he talks better than enough. I'll get this thing for him. Right. And then I got a hold of it, and I just fell deep into the world of, of no, homebrewing. Excellent. Excellent. What, was the, what was the name of your homebrew brand? Oh, Pug Brand Brewing. Pug, br- Pug Brand Brewing. Pug Brand Brewing. Where, what, where did that come from? Have a mug of Pug. Have a mug of Pug. <laughs> Uh, I just think pug dogs are the most hilarious things on the planet. All right. And I just, if I would have an image associated with it, yeah, right. I think as, a, as, as mm-hmm. kind of Steve as a brand, would be pug brand. There you sure. go. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> Humble beginnings. Excellent. Uh, so do you recall what your first brew was? Yeah. Uh, I think my first brew was actually a, it was either a red ale or a West Coast pale ale. When I first started brewing, it was around these times when uh, hot bombs were the right. big thing. I right. say it all the time. It's a 10,000 IBU beer. Right, yes. And so that just turned me off hops yeah. for, a, like, big hop, big hoppy beers for a while. Oh, really? and I think an IPA was one of the last ones that I had looked at brewing just because of that initial initial stumble. Wow. Um, so, yeah, something light hops or, or red ale was yeah, the first one. And then I kind of went off the deep end. I was like, then I tried getting sours and wild beers way right. too quick you're, with way too little right. experience. <laughs> and Once you're that. in, you're in, and you just can't stop. My third beer, I think, was a salted caramel beer. <laughs> and how'd that turn out? Uh, it turned out pretty good. I put it into a, into a competition, and they got what I was going for <laughs> and had some great suggestions on how, about, how to do it next. That's the, that's pretty good for, for official feedback. Got what you were going for. Yeah, that's <laughs> all you want, especially these, these weird things. But I, what kind of happened from there is... For a while, people would come over and be like, hey, Steve, like, what do you have to drink? And you'd really be like, I don't know, nothing you would enjoy. So my brain started to change that. And to like, you know, brew a nice, easy-drinking beer as opposed to a salted caramel or a weird sour that smells like blue cheese. <laughs> right. So obviously there's, there's a learning curve that goes along with, uh, with anything. So yeah. what's the learning curve like with brewing? You know, what, what does it really take... Um, to go from day one, you know, obviously homebrewers usually start with kit beers uh, and then eventually move into designing their own recipes. What's the curve to get from one to the other? Uh, the curve, I think the curve would be different with everybody. Um, but really, it's just practical experience. Uh, not You can do as much kind of research and theoretical beer building as you like. But until you really get into brewing, you really try some things out um, and then do a little bit of analysis once it's done and look back on your notes and kind of how, what your, what your vision was when you created it and how it ended up and just see uh, the translation of it. Uh, just getting your hands on the beer and brewing and really stumbling along the way is the best way of going about it, I find. Right. right. And, and I would imagine you've had some, some bad experiences and, what, you know, what do you... What do you do to recover from a from a bad brew? You don't beat yourself up too much about yeah. it. I think, I think uh, for a while there, I had a, a healthy ratio of fifty one percent success and forty nine percent failure. Um, but you don't beat yourself up too much, and that's what I like about brewing is that it's fun, but it takes two weeks. In two weeks, you know you're gonna know what's going on. So it's not. Everything's not going to crash and crumble. If it doesn't turn out well, also it's beer and it's alcohol. So unless something crazy went bad, then you know you're, you and your friends are going to drink it somehow. So it's uh, yeah, don't beat yourself up too much. Uh, think critically about it, but don't right. overthink it. So, so even if it's a failed experiment, you still get to uh, you still get to you still get to have a few and partake. Right? That's yeah, right. it might be a little bit of a cringe or a pucker on the back end but (laughs) you learn from it you get get to understand what to do next and just become a bit stronger next beer yeah Uh, so you know you're answering these questions you seem to be you know almost almost glowing i would have to say when you talk about beer i mean this obviously uh seems to be an intrinsical part of your life what have you you know what has brewing given to you what has brewing given to your life i think a sense of control is the biggest thing it's like you know whatever I want to do and create I can create brewing is its own little world in every bottle or now every can you can look in that little microcosm and say that's mine and I did that and I enjoy it 
if someone doesn't like it, it's fine. There's a there's a huge subjective quality to brewing. There can be a huge objective quality, absolutely. Uh, but it's that idea that it's this small environment that I'm c- controlling 100% and growing and making stronger. Uh, it's also I'm brewing, and in three to four weeks, I have something great happening. So it's these small, almost micro events, you know, on, on a large scale. It's those small, medium, and long term goals. Medium, you're working towards, you know, say, a new unit or working on the house. You know, every year you might shoot to work towards a trip. But these kind of micro goals are little beers. Right. So, yeah, in, in many people's lives, they might work on projects for months at work. Yeah. Uh, but, but for you, you get to see the rewards every three weeks. Yeah, and that's fantastic. At the same time, getting those every, you know, few months or year few year projects that are set up right. it's this turnaround time that there's always something new to look forward to right. so it's always these little plot points that have positivity and analysis and engagement I find engagement I think I'm much more engaged in small ways right. I think because of beer yeah. Yeah, I gotta I gotta follow up because you've, you've said you know this isn't what you went to school for uh, um, so kind of what what what, ha- what took place what transpired to take you from a, a hobby brewer to, to realizing it's something you could not only achieve but wanted to do professionally. It became setting goals, I feel. Uh, when I started home brewing and the idea of competitions came up, I started enjoying homebrew competitions. Right. Like, how far can you go? How far can you push it? What's the limit? I always, that's what I like to do is, like, how far can I go? Mm-hmm. Uh, always go to something that I learned in school through one of my, one of my programs is go as extreme as you can and then work backwards always go top shelf and then work backwards for it so I started doing competitions to see okay get a good idea about how my beer is turning out where I needed to focus more so uh, to really stabilize and make the beer as solid as it can uh, stylistically and then getting high scores in competitions starting to place in competitions and then what's next after that like as you start to get these goals what do you work on next so my big goal is like get on a big system let's start winning competitions let's start so how, what do I need to do to get that and then I started narrowing in and focusing on making the best beer that I possibly can so it wasn't so much a step or like a moment that clicked where like I want to do this professionally it was I just want to continue my growth Right. With this medium that I'm playing with, professional brewing was the next yeah. was natural the, progression. I guess natural progression absolutely. For, for what you were trying to achieve personally. Yeah, absolutely. That's, that's it wasn't so much I want to become a commercial brewer. It was this is just where it's leading me, and I'll, I'll do it. And so, give us give us a little bit of the insight on on the nitty gritty. What's what's brewing life like? You know, I, I hear uh, I can see uh, you know the brewer you work alongside with Kyle Jepson sitting behind us. Yeah. Uh, he's in the meeting. They they having a couple laughs. So. Uh, you know what's life like? Is it is it is it all work or is there a little bit of fun? Oh, there's absolutely fun. You know, you're playing with beer, so you can again you, you need to think very critically about it, but you got to still have fun with it at the end because it is this. It's this you know liquid. It's this thing that exists that's been around for thousands of years that has been you know I feel it's meant to bring people together. It's an icebreaker. It's a it's a common fundamental. That, that people talk about. You see people from all walks of life coming down around a glass and talking about it. Uh, but on the same token, we need to make its consistency. I find is the biggest thing in commercial brewing is making what you're making consistently every time so you can become a solid part of the community and they always know you're going to be there, which is great. So, so tell me, do you still homebrew or do you still get the chance to be creative at home and, and really get into your element? What's been great, it was... Uh, it was a bit of a shock, I think, when I went from home brewing to commercial because now uh, I get to brew in the big system that we have. It's a 20-barrel system. We get to do the big consistent batches. We get to plan one-offs, and wherever we want to start taking our production and our products, we get to plan for that. I also release a new beer every week. So every week, this this little outlet that I used to do home brewing and try to find time around, oh, I'm, the, I'm going to brew this weekend because I have time. And I want to make a good, like a nice, fun beer. I get to do that every week now, from Monday to Friday. Right. So now I have my weekends free. Mm-hmm. So who am I as a person <laughs> outside of this thing that we do? So when I first started doing this, it was when I first started brewing commercially. It was a little bit of a struggle. It's like, well, what am I doing now? So I just found myself kind of. What's my hobby now? I was like, yeah, what's my hobby? <laughs> I was so I was a little bit listless at the beginning, 
So it's not so much I get to brew at home, but now I get to take care of other aspects of my life and make them stronger. So what, what advice uh, would you give to our listeners uh, for, for beginner brewers? You know, what... Uh, you know, there's 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 so much information out there for home brewing. You know, what what do you think some of the key factors are to, to really getting in it and not getting being overwhelmed uh, with with starting up? Don't be afraid to fail. If something goes wrong, look into why. Uh, there's lists of off flavors and anything that really can go wrong in brewing has gone wrong in brewing. Uh, so you, you'll, you won't be the first at this yeah, point. Yeah, you're not the first and you're not going to be the last of <laughs> things that have happened. And so it's just a way to kind of strengthen it up. Again, don't beat yourself up about it. Just go in with an open mind. Have fun with it. Things are going to work. Things aren't going to work. I've had beer that I've hit every mark that I thought I was going to hit. And the, be- and the, the brew process went fantastic. But my initial recipe that I was playing around with wasn't as strong as it could have been. So even though everything went down well, the beer just wasn't great. Um, Recently, I've started to focus on a lot of brewers go with malt and hops. There's also yeast and water, and water is a new thing that I've started to play around with and really get critical about. Right. And I messed up some beer because of water profile. Water is a very serious thing that I wish I had kind of taken the time to, even in small ways, kind of research and get into when I was home brewing. Right. Uh, well, tell the people uh, your favorite beer style, I guess. <laughs> What's your favorite movie? Uh,. There's three brewers that exist within Steve Crane, I've realized. There's the experimental guy that loves sours and loves wild stuff. So I'm always kind of searching those out. So in that category, my favorite beer, my favorite beer is the Tuamas Gutierrez Gosa. Oh, okay. I love it. And that was one of the, that was, every now and then you run into something that kind of changes your brain. And you think that is something new, is something different, is something that I personally haven't experienced before, even though it's a very traditional Sherman style. It's a thousand years old, but for me, back in 2015, oh <laughs> man, where has this been all my life? Yeah, that's right. Uh, so in that, I, I will always go back to a Gosa. It's a little bit of coriander, a little bit of sea salt. It's bright. It's electric. That sour tart quality just changes the way your palate interacts with different flavors. Uh, the next one, next brewer, is uh, the things that my friends like. The next Steve Crane. The next Steve Crane brewer is the things that my friends like. So it's the easy drinking beer. I spent, my, my claim to fame in my brain is I used superheated stones and I made a Stein beer <laughs> and it was a beer to guard Stein beer and I researched it for six months. It's the first beer I ever like, replicated myself and a friend, Jonathan here. We were actually in my, That's right. uh, my backyard. I, I, was, I was present yeah, for this. <laughs> my, back, my backyard in February in like minus 15 degree weather heating stones and rock maple and birch fire and did a Stein beer and it was great it was complex and I I geeked out about it and then I showed it to my friends and they thought it was okay and then I showed them a mosaic smash ale that I took 15 minutes to conceive and it was one of the best things they thought I had ever made so that's the next one is these things that people are going to enjoy when you come down to it and you want people to come around your table you want people to try the things and enjoy it and have that icebreaker but they're going to look at it like well that was a cool thought and then walk away so i brew things that are very accessible so there's something to say about novelty beers but at the end of the day at the end of the day uh, a a pint of beer that you're going to sit and have a conversation with a friend over is it's kind of the winning ticket it comes down to sometimes sometimes beer is the event and sometimes beer strengthens the event the last one is the Stein beers. It's the weird process beers. It's the historical. It's the part of guile mashing where you're taking the first runnings off your beer and then you're filling it up with water and taking the second running off and then filling it up with water taking the third running off and doing three beers from one grain bill uh, and then adding different malts into it. It's the Stein beers. It's these historical processes and then trying to recreate them with modern equipment. Right. Excellent. Well, uh, Steve, thank you so much for having us here at Spindrift Brewing Company. We really enjoyed it. Uh, Excellent. And we hope to be back. Yeah. Cheers. Cheers. Have a question, topic, suggestion, or comment? You can reach us at cheers at mybrewhq.ca or call us at 1-833-705-7333. We've also got loads of info and tutorials in the Academy section of brewhq.ca. Join us next time for our chat about homebrew clubs. Cheers!
Volunteers. 